poverty. Most of us think of it as a problem that needs to be fixed, but do stereotypes about individuals and communities struggling with poverty blind us to the real solutions to eradicating poverty once and for all? I'm Mike Walter in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. Twenty fourteen marks the fifty year anniversary of an American milestone. The year was nineteen sixty four, and U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson was declaring a war on poverty in this nation. Many Americans held on the of hope. Some because of their poverty, and some because of their color, and all too many because of both. Our task is to help replace their despair with opportunity. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. But like any war, there are casualties and victories. In the last five decades, the success stories in the American war on poverty, though, are few and far between. In fact, the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau indicates that 15 percent of Americans, roughly 46 and a half million people, live at or below the poverty line. And that percentage is roughly the same as it was back in 1983. The current U.S. President, Barack Obama, is reigniting the effort to end poverty in the United States. And the idea that so many children are born into poverty in the wealthiest nation on earth is heartbreaking enough. But the idea that a child may never be able to escape that poverty because she lacks a decent education or health care or a community that views her future as their own. That should offend all of us. And it should compel us to action. We are a better country than this. So let me repeat. The combined trends of increased inequality and decreasing mobility pose a fundamental threat to the American dream our way of life and what we stand for around the globe. But does the war on poverty require new weapons? My next guest says yes. And his innovative approach to helping families break the cycle of poverty is gaining traction. It's seeing results that have eluded government agencies and other social welfare organizations for decades. Mauricio Lim Miller is a MacArthur Genius Fellow. He was appointed by President Obama to the White House Council for Community Solutions. He's also the founder and CEO of the Family Independence Initiative. I want to welcome you to Full Frame. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of this war on poverty. How's the war going? Well, I, I think the biggest thing we've accomplished is to make living in poverty a little bit more tolerable. But I don't know that that's actually what America should be about. So, you know, what the president was saying is that we've lost our mobility. This, this is why my family came to this country is because this was the country where if you came, you worked hard. You know, you could make it into the success you wanted, middle class or, or whatever. And that dream is kind of eluding all of us, so too many of us in the country. You attained the American dream, but I mean, your struggle was not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mother, Mexican, single mom with two kids, my sister and I, came to work hard. I mean, there was no qualms about, okay, if that's what America requires, we'll, we're going to do that. And we came and... She gave her all, but you know, the um, community was different here. The culture was different here. Um, my sister ended up, you know, with the wrong kids, uh, pregnant at 16, pulled out of the house into an abusive relationship, um, and it was traumatizing for my mother. You know, she came here to save her kids, and within about a year, you know, she had lost one, and uh, she then turned to me as like, "This can't happen again." And so she actually sacrificed the rest of her life, and she ultimately she took her own life in order for my life to actually be in a position to take care of my sister. It was going to take too much to take care of her. And so it was a like, okay, at least I got one kid out. Now, America has to be a little bit better than that. A little bit, a lot better than that, obviously. <laughs> yeah. um, so you end up going to Berkeley, and your mom has this dream that you'll be successful and you'll go off and do these things, and, and you set out to do these things. But how much of your past life drew you back to what you do now? 
Well, for me then it was entering a different world coming out of UC Berkeley. I lived, you know, single mom, Mexican, two kids. It was it was rough. It was it was a hard life. And watching my sister's life was really hard. And all of a sudden, just because I graduated from Berkeley, which we didn't understand what Berkeley meant, but you tell people you graduate from Berkeley, all of a sudden, it's kind of like this genius award. People think differently of you. You know, the same person. Um, and I realized that I entered a different world. And the fact is that you know there is a world in America that if you're in that other world, there are opportunities that if you do work hard, you can succeed. The trouble is that if you're on the bottom of the economic ladder, that world is not accessible at this point in time. But it's interesting, a lot of people, uh, and, I, and maybe this is the wrong way to look at it, but a lot of people on this road of life would be content to look in the rearview mirror and say, that's my past. And yet, uh, you go back and you're working with people who started on the lower rungs, and you're trying to give them a pathway out. And it's not a program, as you pointed out. Uh, you're not all about programs and let's do this or tinker at the edges. You just are trying to empower a lot of these people in many respects. Well, not initially. I initially, I went into it because, you know, my fam family had struggled so, so much. And, and I'm, I'm very American. You know, I, I'm really nationalistic. And this is what's supposed to be America, and I wanted that to happen for everybody, and it seemed like something's wrong. But by this time, Lyndon B. Johnson had this war on poverty. We were 30 years into it, and I'm over there. I'm going to join the war on poverty to see if it can be better for other families, you know, see what would be really, what would have helped my mother, what she would have approved of. And for 20 years, I ran social services, and we were considered one of the best in the country. I got invited by Clinton and stuff. I'm over there. You know, my mother would not approve of my services. She wouldn't go through them. I wouldn't send my, kid, my nephew and nieces through it because they were too paternalistic, right? And my mother, pride and self-respect and making decisions, that, that's what really drove her. And the system doesn't allow for that self-determination. And so I realized that now being part of the middle class and, and having, you know, nephew and nieces that were still struggling, that the system, the way it was structured and, and my 20 years into it, something was wrong. And so, yeah, I did that other system, and ultimately, if it wasn't good enough for my family, I didn't understand why I would put other families through it. But it's, it's funny because uh, you and I had a chance to just talk briefly, and there's this great story you tell about this, this Salvadoran family, they're going to buy this house, and your <coughs> yeah. staffers are very concerned. Tell the story, because I think it, it kind of gets at the heart of what you're all about in many respects. I, I think that um, when I started this project, which is Family Independence Initiative, uh, it was because I was disappointed with social services. And I felt like, well, let's at least find out, you know, what families can do for themselves and each other. And I knew that my mother had a lot of capacity. So I knew her potential was really there, but I didn't know about other families. So it was really started with the help of Jerry Brown to find out what, what people could do for themselves. And I promised Jerry Brown that uh, at that well, Jerry time... Jerry Brown's the governor of California. For, now, we've got an international uh, audience, so they're not, not as familiar. He, and true. at that point in time, he was... Yeah, Jerry Brown, yeah, he'd run for president. He's national stature, but he was mayor of Oakland at the time. And he knew me and he knew of my work. As I said, it was fairly well known. And he challenged me. It's like, you know, something must be wrong with the war on poverty if we haven't impacted after 30 years. That's 50 years now. So um, I started the project with Jerry just to find out what the capacity was of families to help themselves and each other, which was the history of, of the United States. Okay, that's how people had actually done it. That's how my mother really came to do it. And um, about six or seven months into the project, I was working with about 25 low-income families from different communities. And I didn't know what they were going to do, but I had promised Jerry that we would not interfere. I, we wanted clean data. I was an engineer for a while. I wanted clean data so what people would do, and I was not going to interfere with any social workers or anything. No advice, no counseling. But one day my staff comes in and says, oh, there's this one refugee family from El Salvador. Um, they actually have no savings, but there was a Spanish-speaking uh, real estate broker that told him he could help them buy a house down at the end of the street. And they're going after this house, and we think he's actually a predatory lender. He's going to take all their money. He's going to scam them, right? And can we talk to them? Can we tell them they should take financial training or whatever? And I'm over there, no. You know, I promised Jerry that we would not interfere, so we just can't interfere. I says, but they're going to make all these mistakes. And I said, well, you know, my mother made mistakes. And the fact is you learn from mistakes. And, you know, if it turns out the way uh, that you're saying, that maybe people will learn or they'll learn. Well, sure enough, it turned out the way they said. So at closing is when he makes his money. So he got them to close on the house, but their mortgage was 65% of their income. Jeez. My staff comes in and says, they're going to lose the house. I'm over there, yeah, they're going to lose the house. My staff is pissed at me at this point in time. Over there. But, you know, we stayed true. We're not interfering. You know, we're just going to see what people do. So the next thing that happened, you know, I didn't foresee. 
friends had helped them with the down payment, right? Because they needed that extra money. And so these friends that all, all had a stake in the house then started retiling, repainting, re-landscaping it. They had figured out they had gotten into the wrong thing, but they had this house. So after all that work, the value went up, they refinanced, I set in on the refinance, they got their mortgage to be manageable, and all of a sudden it was clear they're not gonna lose this house, not with this community supporting this family around this house. The uh, next thing that happened was there were six other families that were with them in the cohort that we were testing this whole thing of what your capacity is to, to work together. And so um, once they saw Jorge and Maria Elena buy that house and make a mistake and still end up with a house because of community, within a year and a half, all other five families owned a house in Oakland. And I wonder, that is really fascinating. I saw their whole behavior change, the expectation about having assets in the United States changed. Then the next thing that happened is that the, it wasn't just the six families. All of a sudden, other friends that they knew started saying, well, maybe I'm not going to send all my money back to El Salvador. Maybe I can build assets. Maybe I can stay in the United States. So the set of expectations totally changed in a broader, broader community. And if I and my staff had come and saved Jorge Maria Elena, we would have saved one house. We would have never changed expectations. It was Jorge and his wife that really changed that community. Let's get that real estate guy in jail, though. No, you no. know, <laughs> I think nobody else used him. <laughs> well, that's, 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 the key, that's the key lesson there. But the interesting thing is, is uh, I think what you're saying is adversity is a way of life if you try and circumvent. And it also is a, a byproduct that, that creates wisdom. I mean, yes. obviously that family learned a lot, but so did all the friends. Yeah, and you know, I, I became middle class and realized that rich people, they make all the same mistakes. They end up on drugs, you know, they get depressed, they need child care, you know. That actually it all happens in kind of the same way, whether you're rich or you're poor, it's, you know, these are all personal kind of issues. But rich people don't get stereotyped as somehow being untrustworthy or not able to make good decisions. But if you're low income and you, you have a, or you make a mistake, like my mother made a mistake with my sister, you know, leaving her in the neighborhood, you know, or putting her actually into a good high school where everybody else was rich and, and we weren't rich. So she made mistakes, but then she was classified as a bad mother. And that isn't, you know, That's the way right. we can build a community. You know, what's interesting is you were talking about uh, President Clinton, Hillary Clinton. Uh, they love you when you're doing the social work. You're, you're at the top of the game. And then you, you look and you say, no, this isn't right. And now you've kind of turn things upside down in a sense. Um, if President Obama was sitting here and said, you gotta help me, how, how am I gonna win this war on poverty? What would you say? You know, if President Obama was sitting there and I could talk to him, he would get this. Uh, because he came out of organizing, he came out really from a family that if he looks at his life and the way he and his friends kind of grew up and how they counted on each other and how it was important to have the whole family unit working and that it was important to have that respect that it was your family and community that was really the important piece for it. Not an outside mentor, not an outside. Those came in, but really it was family and community that he would understand. The dilemma we have, and I've had with politicians, is that they are in a structure that says, for you to be elected, you have to do something to help them. You have to say what you're going to do, what you're going, you're going to lead. And the problem we're having in this country is that institutions, government, philanthropy, all want to be the leader. And my project is that, no, you don't know every family. You don't know Jorge Maria Elena. You don't know what their strengths are. They have to lead it. You can play a role. You can play a supportive role. So the issue with the president would be, Go back to how you were raised, what you understand personally. Go back to how community, how important. And tell people, no, me as president, I'm not going to do that. Go back to John F. Kennedy and says, what, what can you do for your country, right? And that's what Obama needs to do. He needs to go back to the families and say, look, it, I don't know all your lives. I can't structure a government program. I know that's what I'm supposed to sell to you or to the country to say that I'm, I'm a good person. But no, you're going to have to take care of each other. And I'll be there. I'll be behind you. I'll be your backstop. Does that message resonate, though? I mean, you must, you must have politicians who are like, no, but we've got these programs. We put them in place. And, and you're like, you're not about the programs. No, you know, the thing is that as we've tracked families for the last 12, 13 years, programs and services play maybe a 10% role in your life. You know, that's not what changes everything. And yet we've thrown 50 years of our revenues and everything into programs. 
10% of your life doesn't change everything. As we've tracked what changes people's lives, it has to do with their friends coming together. It's like Jorge Maria Elena, all of us and their friends coming together. The role modeling that happens, you know, this is like historic. Under heavy discrimination, you had African Americans before and after slavery build entire townships. They had theaters, banks, you name it. We're losing that in communities because we, in many ways, we've thrown so much money and so many programs in. We're replacing that sense of community, that sense of family. And that is that there is harm being done, and that we should not be doing. You know, it's funny, uh, I, I know you're a genius, but uh, it, it seems to me a lot of what you're saying is, is kind of like it takes a village. I mean, we, we've learned from other cultures. I mean, your own Mexican ancestry, I mean, you can see that in, in villages in Mexico. You can see it in Asia. Um, it, it, it's almost, you almost want to say it's a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. I don't understand. You know, I, I do kind of, we've actually tried to understand why it's been so hard for people in what was my social sector, I, 20 years running services, why so many of them have a difficult time letting go of, you know, that particular way of they are the ones, they are the primary helpers, when they know in their own lives, they don't run it that way, right? So they kind of lose common sense. And the fact is that somebody was telling me who does, does you know, major scaling internationally with the USAID, and with this, you're threatening a lot of people's jobs. You mm. know, you're threatening their control, their, because we love to be in control. That's one of the basic premises is Jorge Marila need to be in control. Well, if you have money and resources and you're in philanthropy or government or an executive director of a program, you want to be in control too. But the fact is you're in a social position that you can then control other people's lives and that can't go. You know what's interesting is it, it almost sounds like LBJ or even Barack Obama, they shouldn't declare war on poverty. It's, it's Jose and, and Maria, the people that you keep mentioning. I mean, those are the ones that have right. to declare and they're the ones who can win the war. I yeah. mean, is that essentially the truth? I, I, totally, it is. And I think what we need is we need the families to step up. Now, I came out of the 60s in Berkeley. And, you know, it was civil rights movement was still going. The Black Panthers were out there. And it was all about the people. These were all people movements, right? They were the ones. Now, we got a little bit over the top. I, you know, I was a student, and maybe we didn't trust anybody over 30 and whatever. So we kind of screwed up. But the fact is, at that point, it was people's movements. Then, J, you know, LBJ declared a war on poverty and now became the government's movement. That was not a big help. You know, what we needed is a marriage of those two. It still needs to be led by people. But we do need government support. We need philanthropy. We need, but they have to play a supportive role. Really, what we've given these families is to, you know, we've, we've given them Head Start and, and we've given them food stamps and we've made life a little bit more tolerable. And the dilemma is when you make life in poverty, because we have a lot of people in poverty, more tolerable, they're less likely to be on the streets complaining. And so in many ways, we've also killed that movement building mm -hmm. that I had seen in the 60s. When you get this chance to get off to Hawaii, which I know is your dream, and, and you're all retired, and, and uh, a young kid comes up and says, Mr. Miller, tell me about your accomplishments in life. Uh, what would you point to? What would you say? My two kids, um, they have their druthers. I had to back off. Um, you know, even as a parent, you, you have this tendency to want to lead and, you know, and shape and, and whatever. And after a while, uh, I know my daughter is like, you know, you better just accept me. You know, and there was a lot of learning that we, if you have any kind of power, because you're a parent or you have more money or whatever, you really have to back off. Humanity is a wonderful thing. And to know that my kids are good people and they're on their own and whatever, that's the best. But it's in a sense, that's what you bring to the job too, is you back off and you let the people that you're trying to help kind of guide the way in a sense. You know what's fascinating is I know that a lot of my, you know, my colleagues kind of social sector, because I worked for 20 years and I knew all these folks, um, they, I know that they enjoy the fact that they can come up with ideas and they can implement them and they can help people, because they do, they can make poverty more tolerable. They can actually do these things and they feel really good. And that's what I did for 20 years. I designed, I ran, I led, and, and I had 120 staff. You know what's been fascinating now, because I can't lead, you know, philosophically can't, it is this fascinating sense of accomplishment when you see Jorge and Maria Elena succeed. And all you're doing is sitting there and you're sitting and translating for them when they're signing their refinance papers. You know, it is just, if not more satisfying, to play a secondary role as it is to play a primary role.
And I think we've got to get that sector to really move to understand that. Well, I think they're delighted that you helped in the way that you did. No doubt about it. Thanks so yeah. much for coming in and joining Thank us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been great fun.